Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Jeshri Ben, Rashmi, Peace, uh, Olga, for uh, joining this conversation today. Uh, thank you for making the time on behalf of Team Pinbox. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to the seventh Pinbox webinar on digital micropension inclusion. Uh, it's a great privilege to be a part of the uh, Financial Inclusion Week. Uh, we've been doing this consistently for several years. Uh, for the benefit of everyone, I also want to uh, welcome you all today. There is a Dhanteras in India where uh, we welcome prosperity into our homes, our lives, our businesses. Uh, it's a day that you uh, that is prosperity for women too. So Jeshri Ben had a little prayer meeting in our house today as well. Yes. So happy Dhanteras uh, to all the viewers uh, here from India. Uh, getting on to the topic for today. Um, Globally, pension benefits are linked to employment contracts and therefore usually restricted to salaried workers. Um, on an average, over 90% of the workers across Asia, Africa and Latin America and over half of the workforce in Latin America are self-employed. Olga, I'm sure you'll agree. And since they don't have an employer, they're not eligible for any pension or any social security benefits. Uh, as per UN's aging projections, over 2 billion currently work, uh, young workers globally would have crossed the age of 60 in the next 30 years, which is just round the corner, honestly. Eight in every 10 of them will be living in developing countries. And as things stand, nearly 1.5 billion of these future elderly are neither prepared nor are they preparing for their retirement. The only way for them to escape <clears throat> over this 20 years of extreme poverty is to immediately start saving for their retirement. And honestly, this is the only option. Now, if I were to set an example, say, if a 25-year-old uh, in India opened an account in the National Pension Scheme uh, and started saving even a dollar a day in real terms, uh, the person could actually achieve an inflation indexed pension, which is very important given the amount of value that it would be for 30 years from now. They could get a pension of over $500 at 2021 20, prices for 20 years, for the next 20 years after their retirement. So saving for old age may be feasible for hundreds of millions of people, but this will be difficult for most women in India. And I guess equally for women in Rwanda, Uganda, Chile, Indonesia, or Bangladesh, or uh, any of the other developing countries. Since women face very unique challenges, that makes them much more vulnerable to old age poverty. Um, as various reports from the World Economic Forum, the World Bank, Interdevelopment Bank, HelpAge, MRSA, all suggest that women globally, and not just in developing countries, I must add that, live much longer than men. Therefore, they will need much more money in hand for a much longer retirement than men. As a World Economic Forum paper also suggests, women face a number of headwinds, both before and during retirement, to create a perfect storm, if I may give this connotation typically resulting in dramatically lower financial security in retirement than men. So women are able to accumulate enough savings for, a, uh, sorry, women are unable to accumulate enough savings for a longer retirement for, I think, three reasons. And if you'll allow me, I'd like to um, sort of state out these three reasons. The first is the labor markets and the incomes. Women are significantly underrepresented at all levels of workforce. They are also disproportionately more likely than men to be in the informal employment. Women also form the majority of the unpaid workforce in most countries. As a result of their fragile labor market attachments, very few women become eligible for employment-based pension and social security arrangements. Now, although women will need more money in old age than men, their ability to save enough is further compromised since women usually earn less than men in comparable jobs, face frequent income interruptions as they are forced to take care, uh, take career breaks or work part-time or take care of the children or the elderly at home. And women also tend to drop, drop out of workforce earlier than men. The second reason would be financial literacy, exclusion, and access constraints. 
um, women may be less financially literate and thus less confident about making financial decisions. I'm making a very clear demarcation that education does also means uh, women are also better savers. However, they may be less confident in making financial decisions. Hence, they tend to, to be more cautious about taking risks than men and are less likely than men to have a bank account or a payments account. As a result, women usually save in cash, which because of the value of their savings to deplete over a time due to inflation. And the third reason is demography, social and cultural challenges. Women make the most uh, majority of the single parent households uh, without affordability and access to childcare. Women are restricted in the work opportunities that they can consider. Women also tend to have less control on their income and financial decisions and may be forced by husbands to abandon a savings program in favor of a more uh, immediate consumption. Importantly, since women live longer than men and are usually much younger than their husbands, women end up saving much more, spending much more time living alone in retirement without anyone to share their expenses. Clearly, we need a gender lens. And this is why our panel is here today, where we are designing policies, regulations, communications, and products for women. And we need a good balance, both legislative and non-legislative interventions to ensure that women are able to achieve a secure and dignified retirement. In this context, and I'm super excited that we have an excellent panel of global experts who will share their perspectives, ideas, experiences with designing and implementing pension and financial inclusion policies and strategies which are targeted at women. And some of the challenges I described resonate equally for the countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Then it could be well that we could collectively design a model and an approach that could be replicated and adopted by multiple countries across these continents. Uh, it's not a dream because I think it can be a reality. And with that note, allow me to kindly introduce a spectacular panel today. We have Olga. Olga is uh, the Chilean pension regulator. We have Peace. Peace is uh, Rwanda's pension regulator. Jeshri Ben requires no introduction. She's the MD of Seva Bank. And uh, my dear friend Rashmi, she is the CEO of FSD Uganda. Uh, Peace, if I may start with you, um, uh, BNR and Menikofin, that is the Ministry of Finance in Rwanda, have been leading digital financial inclusion. Um, how are women responding to digital financial services? Uh, are uh, there any challenges in women using mobiles or digital account activations and payments? I would love to know what is working and what are the learnings of, from Rwanda's experience. Thank you so much, Parul, and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure for me to be here and just share from the Rwandan experience. Uh, and if I could start from uh, digital financial inclusion, uh, one area that, of course, we've seen you know, a significant uptick has been on uh, mobile financial services. And if I could uh, uh, speak a little more to that, uh, we do uh, conduct a survey every um, every four years, the FinScop survey, which basically uh, speaks to us about the level of financial inclusion in the country uh, and in, in, uh, informs uh, policy interventions with the regard to financial inclusion. So the last FinScop that we actually conducted in uh, 2020 um, did show you know, a lot of uh, interesting statistics, especially with regard to digital financial inclusion. Uh, and I'll speak mainly to the space around uh, mobile, mobile uh, payments, mobile mobile uh, financial services. Uh, what the survey actually showed us was that about 87% of the population had access to a mobile phone. Um, and so this was, you know, like a fast step for, for access of digital financial services. Um, so, and then in addition to that, it also showed us that three or five adults, that's about 60, 61% of uh, the population, actually does, uh, uses uh, mobile money, mobile financial services. Now, when you try to break that down in terms of uh, gender uh, 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 access, uh, like I said, 87% of the population has access to a mobile phone, but you start to see you know, a difference when it comes to women. Uh, when you break this down, uh, you realize we realize that about 90% of men 
had access to a mobile phone compared to 84% for females. Now, that's still a good number, uh, but you see that already you, you start to see a difference between the men and the women. Uh, when you break it down further to use of mobile financial services, again, you see the gender gap uh, in terms of use of mobile uh, financial services. Uh, I said 60, about 61% of the total population actually used mobile financial services. Uh, but when you break that down into gender, you find about 68%, close to 70% of men do use uh, mobile financial services compared, compared to just about 56% for females. So you start to see a, a, a difference there. Now, the question that you asked in terms of uh, what is driving that uh, that that uh, no, so the first question that you asked you know how is the the uptake uh, we see that there is very good uptake of of digital financial services but Two, we also see that there is a gender gap in, in, in usage of these uh, mobile financial services. What is informing that? I think you spoke to it uh, in your introductory remarks, partly, uh, Peru, in terms of um, uh, the, the the involvement in the workplace. Um, so to the extent that you know there is limited disposable income, there's limited income uh, that also limits their access to a mobile phone and access to to, to mobile financial services. Now um, that of course is is opening up a space in terms of policy interventions um, in driving uh, access to mobile phones for women. And here we're working with uh, with uh, telecommunication companies and other partner. Uh, in uh, institutions um, to to increase usage and access of, uh, of mobile phones uh, for women within the different groups that they work in, whether it is village uh, savings groups and things like that, or, or other NGOs that they work with uh, very, that are closer to the population. So making sure that there's actually access to the mobile phone is a key starting place. Uh, allow me to stop there for now, Peru. Uh, thank you so much. I think you've uh, made a very important point on the uptake of mobiles. Uh, Olga, I was going to come to you on the pension reforms, but just one quick question, uh, Rashmi, and I'd love to bring you in here, is uh, I know that you've had experience on the uptake of uh, payments and mobiles, and Rwanda clearly sort of giving um, a way to say, you know, between a 90% and an 84% between men and women, there isn't that much of a gap. How would you compare that to something like this that was about two, three years ago, maybe? Or is this unique to Rwanda and the progress that the country is showing? Um, hi, everyone, and hi to the audience that's uh, dialed in and listening. So, Parul, that's that's a really interesting question. So if I, and, and peace raises an important point. So when you look at mobile money statistics in East Africa, the uptake of digital financial services has largely been around payments. So if we try to then start assessing how much of the, how much money is being left in wallets as deliberate savings, how, how what is the uptake of credit, especially among middle and low income populations? How is InsureTech playing a role in the uptake of insurance? Because when we talk about financial inclusion, what we truly mean is what, how do people save, borrow, um, invest, make payments? That's the life cycle of the needs that people have in order to build resilience. And unfortunately or fortunately, in most East African markets and others where there's a lot of mobile money, a lot of the financial inclusion was driven, and that's good, I'm not saying that's bad, has been through digital payments. But payments alone doesn't drive resilience. It's savings, credit, insurance that's necessary for upward mobility, for building resilience. That's ne we, we need all of these products. And that's why we're talking about micro insurance. So when you come to, um, I can speak for Uganda. So in the case of Uganda, when you look, you know, what we did as FST Uganda, we used exactly as Peace said, Finsco, uh, which is a demand side statistical survey of the depth of financial inclusion in a country. And what we then realized is that we, we bucketed men and women into the into three categories. So 40% poorest, 40% middle income, and 20% rich. And the median saving in 40% poorest men and women was zero. 
just even before we, we did this as a uh, as a function of the pandemic we wanted to test the resilience of the poorest before the pandemic it was zero they had this was liquid savings they had semi liquid savings and illiquid savings like savings in chicken goats etc and that's the way they were building resilience because all of the resilience was trying to match cash flow if you have if your expenditure pattern is regular it is consistent but your income patterns aren't because you're in the informal sector you're in agriculture etc so you are constantly doing making choices around how to invest the the money that you have today into something that can give you medium term returns you don't have the liquidity for a very long term based investment don't know if i answered your question carol but hopefully no, that I, was useful no i i am going to come back with you uh, on what's happening in uganda but i'd love to bring in olga here uh, olga chile is uh, chile actually is one of the first countries to embark on pension reforms in the 80s um yet i think millions of self employed workers in chile are neither prepared nor preparing for their old age and a part of the problem is that both regulations and the pension systems in chile are designed for salaried workers so what is the pension supervisor doing or proposing to do to increase pension coverage especially for uh, among low income self employed women uh thank you uh First of all, thanks for this invitation, and also thanks to the audience. Um, and, uh, and I am really learning a lot from my my colleagues here. So uh, you are right. In the case of Chile, uh, the private uh, system was introduced in in 1981, uh, and um, for several years, uh, the the main pillar was the contributory pillar with individual accounts, and uh, and and the people contributing to this pillar were dependent uh, workers. Uh, so the the participation of self employed uh, men and women was very low because the participation was voluntary and and the take up uh, uh, was uh, below 5%. Um then uh, in a major pension reform in 2008 a measure was introduced uh, to incorporate the self employed workers to the system and and at the, at the beginning uh, this measure was uh, was intro- was introduced with a opting out mechanism so we use uh, the lesson from uh, behavioral finance behavioral economics and uh, we incorporate the self employed workers uh, using a automatic enrollment mechanism uh, through the annual income tax uh, exercise um and then uh, the the self employed had the option to to optima, optim out uh, of this but um, but the, the the measure was that uh, that if you uh, didn't uh, opt out uh, from the automatic enrollment you pay your contributions using uh, your tax um, uh, receipt Uh, so this is what's more or less successful um, and uh, give way uh, to introduce in 2019 a mandatory uh, contribution for the self employed uh, the one that participate uh, in the annual uh, income tax uh, exercise uh, uh, made the, the participation of this self employed work mandatory without uh, the the optim out uh, mechanism uh, but uh, still there's a lot of uh, a lot of work because uh, there's a there's a segment of the population uh, uh, that uh, are informal workers that do not participate in the in the in the income tax exercise and also we need to Uh, increase coverage of, of of those workers so in terms of uh, gender equity uh, also the the pension reform in 2008 introduced uh, some particular measures to to increase the equity of the system one of them was to give a, a bonus per child uh, to women uh, this was uh, this is a universal uh, benefit Uh, and the, the the idea was to compensate women for for all the period in which they are not active uh, because they are taking care of 
of their children. Um, also, uh, we have incorporated a new uh, type of affiliate, which is the name is uh, volu uh, voluntary affiliate in which someone else uh, can pay contribute uh, pension contribution for you uh, um, and uh, that allow for instance women and children to be incorporated to the system even though they are not participating in the uh, in the labor market uh, so these are these are, are, are the measures that uh, we have already uh, incorporated to the system and also uh, during the pandemic and uh, in the context of a new law of a labor protection law uh, we incorporate uh, domestic workers uh, that uh, most of them are women domestic workers uh, we incorporate them formally to the uh, unemployment uh, unemployment insurance um, I think that's a very, very interesting angle of the opt-out for informal sector workers. But uh, Jashi Ben, if I can set the stage for you, um, we spoke about uh, you know mobile uptake amongst women getting better. Uh, Rashmi mentioned that you know uh, before the pandemic, perhaps or during as well, people really didn't have enough savings uh, in the low-income workforces and focused on women. And Olga spoke about an opt-out option for the informal sector workforce and some extra benefits for women. But Jeshi Ben, you are coming from a place where you started micro pensions 15 years ago. And, and it was a huge success story. Uh, thousands of women opened micro pension <coughs> accounts to save a bank. And I believe this to date continue to save for their old age. How did you ever achieve this incredible outcome? And I think all of us uh, would love to know what worked and what do you think were the main challenges? Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, Parul Um <clears throat> First of all, I would like to say that, you know, um, uh, Save Our Self-Employed Women's Association is an organization which is organizing women workers in the informal sector. And those women are vegetable vendors and, you know, all those kinds of women. So what was basically happening was that in spite of their working very hard, they had to borrow from money lenders at high rate of interest. And that was the reason why they decided to start their own bank. So that Seva Bank, which is a bank, which is a bank which is promoted by women workers in the informal sector. And we have around 2 million, uh, two million this kind of women, they are working as here. So what was happening was that initially, of course, that, you know, we were trying to help them to save, we were trying to help them to come out of the clutches of money lenders and also expanding and helping them to give uh, credit so that you know, they can expand their businesses. So, but I'm t what I'm talking about is that, you know, they were working very hard, but on day-to-day -day basis, you know, they were earning and they were they were uh, saving, but they were save, saving very little. And uh, that was also, you know, it was only for, only for uh, I, I would say it was, it was only for, you know, uh, ensuring that, you know, tomorrow we will, uh, if we need money, we will we'll get it. So that was basically the point. And we, for years, years, you know, they were good repayers, they were good savers, but we saw that, what was happening was that at the, like for example i'll just give you one example that you know one woman who was 75 years old and she was uh, uh, she was uh, making you know cigarettes at home so home, home based worker and she came to us and she said give us a give us a give me a loan of 75 years loan to a 75 year old it was I mean, very difficult. Similarly, you know, there were so many old women. We were saying that, you know, they were there, but they were not able to. You know, I mean, they wanted to work and they had to work, but you know, it was very difficult for them to really work. So, and there was no kind of uh, any kind of social security which was available to them, or any pension work was not available. So we saw that at least, you know. I mean, this is first generation, but we also saw that the second generation of these women were also coming in. And we try to understand that, you know, how can we help that, you know, they can at least have have kind of a pension or whatever kind of, a, uh, you know, old age security. And that was the reason why we try to understand that how can we help these women to link with pension because as, as, a, as usual, because they are in the informal sector, they didn't have any kind of... A, you know, uh, so this kind of a social security for pension. So 
uh, initially we tried to do our own uh, our own, by our own way but of course the, it's a very you know that's the reserve bank of india so the regulator was so uh, said that you know you can't have long term savings for this women so that we could not do it even if we were a bank so <clears throat> what we tried to do was that you know we could we could go to some other organization which can help us and fortunately it was uti which was a mutual fund so we could get in in contact with them of course thanks to i would say gautam bai so and when we talked about all these things that you know this women this women at least the second generation women would need this uh, <clears throat> first first firstly they said that you know how, how is it possible what is the contribution that you know they will they be regularly contributing and the second thing was that you know there is no such kind of uh, pension for in for form informal women so but with all uh, but then finally finally we i mean we could come up with this but then there was there were so many other other things which was happening the first thing i'm talking of from the women's point of view the women were you know they were so much i mean the way they were we were trying to understand what is their financial behavior and it was that they were working on day to day basis so they were earning on day to day basis and thinking on day to day basis also so when we were even talking with them that you know can you can we have this kind of a pension they said how can we have they were just saying that you know um, <clears throat> i even don't know whether i will be alive at, at 60 years old so that kind of thing so they were they didn't have that kind of even understanding that you know we should so even they they thought that it is the it is the official uh, uh, you know bureaucrats who get it not not we cannot have any pension so that was on one hand there was a problem the, on the other hand they, i mean they, there was definitely a problem with it as supply supply line but finally we we could come to terms uh, <clears throat> and then we uh, so we had this kind of one mutual fund thing which was available so we could do it that they would contribute every month 50 rupees say if the let's say it became 100 rupees also though you know this was something which we had start decided and uh, up to 60 years they don't have to withdraw and then they will get whatever they whatever is lump sum money then they will get pension pension on this of course it was not a, a annuity <coughs> it was the only pension thing so, but what was happening was that the first thing was they uh, they did understand that now this is possible but it was also mutual fund they had never seen they had never understood what is been uh, mean uh, you know mutual fund so the first thing what we had to do had make them understand what is mutual fund the second thing was that you know in banks they were when they were saving it was it was the interest which was fixed but here in in mutual fund there is no fixed interest so then uh, you know they were asking that how much money we will get and, and why should we do this so then we had to give them all those kinds of type you know tables and other things where what uh, you know parul ben was saying that financial literacy was the first thing and pension literacy was the second thing we one was that you know the first thing was that it was the it was the concept the concept of pension they never knew what is pension and whether we can have it so that was the concept we had to do you know concept questions and concept Uh, literacy i would say that you know by by why pension why you need pension the second thing was the product because we were talking about product which contribute for longer period and they were all saying that you know we we don't know whether we will be alive or not so they didn't want to do that and the third thing and and the third thing was that they were they were also saying that you know we don't know how much interest we will earn out of it and in in mutual fund it is nav so we had to explain to them and us that what is nav and other things but you know but when they started doing it but they understood that you know that there the, the need for pension but what happened was that the i think the best thing which was there was uh, <clears throat> that it was power of compounding because it was mutual fund and that was the, when they saw that statement because they were regularly saving and when they saw the statement that oh we our money is growing our money is growing that was something which they really learned and then they they also you know not only they were saving but they were also telling to other neighbors and others also that we should do it so in one year we could get 2 lakh 200000 women who 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 are contributed into this and they started working on it so this was something which was first for the i think first for the country that you know that was a first pension pension for them but i would say even today when we are asking a woman that you know uh, just why don't why are you not enrolling in 
pension the first answer was will be i don't know whether i will be alive for 60 years but but then it is i think i am just say i am just seeing is that the kind of security which they are getting because they will have money for them and the second thing was also it is though it was the power of com- compounding i would say that is two things which help them and now uh, it is now third generation and third generation girls they do want to do it and now there are also national other national uh, schemes are also coming for pension but i would say this linking with mutual fund was really i would say it, it was a success and i we still see that you know it is a success because they they have 50000 rupees now they have to, uh, you know 1 lakh rupees they have with them which they had never seen in their life thank you so much jashri ben i think all of us are all starry eyed listening to you and your experience uh, i think you were actually probably the first person globally to have achieved 200000 women joining in just one year and uh, since 2012 i think they still continue to save even after more than uh, about nearly a decade uh um peace i wanted to of course equally exhilarating conversation on uh the side of the experience of um rwanda but before that i just wanted to again rashmi bring you in um you know um, i remember during our conversations we were you know extensively talking about the product mix um um and how uh, this is an important part of uh, you know getting to where we need to go so jashri ben brought out a concept first then she spoke about literacy then she says there will be a you know pension literacy and then finally there is a product mix and i would love to hear what we discussed earlier for the benefit of everyone on the kind of mix that may be required and then of course peace will come right to you again sort of understanding the ground reality on the implementation of ejoheza rashmi thank you uh thank you parul that's it's an actually very complicated question So um since we're talking you know in your introductory remarks what you said is that especially on the african continent 85% of the labor force is in the informal market and that's certainly true for the countries that we work in um now there is a the one of the questions that we've been grappling with as fsd uganda is the traditional form as dr olga mentioned of how pension schemes are structured for salaried workers are certainly not going to translate for informal workers it is not going to translate in terms of how do you target them the identification how do you even onboard them because as jashri ben said there is not enough digital literacy then you need financial literacy pension literacy so what happens if you were a, if you were a say in uganda we have the national social security fund um which which is trying to bring in informal workers have more voluntary uh, savings for the long term what happens to your unit economics around cost of customer acquisition who is responsible for actu- uh, training uh, you know uh, getting the uh, getting workers literacy etc how do you build that model out and as jeshri ben said the ticket size of savings are going to be significantly lower so there is there's a lot in there packed in there and one of the questions then becomes is how do we incentivize more and more um self employed as well as um wage workers to join the system can we do the gift of pension scheme that all the dr olga mentioned or can we create other fiscal and non fiscal incentives for uh, women and low income workers to join and what would those incentives look like mm-hmm. so i don't know if i answered your question parol adequately but um, yeah uh, no i think rashmi i was also asking about um uh, the adequacy of the product design in terms of when does pension come mm-hmm. in the sequence of savings uh, but i think i'll just right. go to peace before i come to you to ask that question again uh, peace i think we're all also waiting to hear it. i mean in december 2018 Rwanda launched a national voluntary long term saving schemes uh, or a micro pension scheme as we call it uh 3 years later what is the status of ejoheza we would love to know the meaning of ejoheza and uh, how have um the fiscal incentives and the structure of the product design actually helped in driving voluntary participation for women especially Yeah thank you Peru. Uh, so I think the Rwandan case is very similar to what uh, my colleagues have shared uh, when we look at uh, Rwanda is a, you know is a is a country with a population of about um, 12 million people now. 
Um, when you look at the labor force, the labor force is about um, just a little over 50% of that. And um, when we look at the the structure of the of of the of the of the pension sector, should I say? Uh, of course, we have the mandatory scheme, um, just like uh, my colleague from Uganda shared about. Um, but the, the the mandatory scheme, which is uh, administered by our Rwanda Social Security uh, Board, uh, only covered covers uh, salaried uh, people in both the formal and uh, sorry, in both the the private and public sector. Uh, and the coverage of that is about, let's say, 10% of, 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 the, of the working population. Um, when you look at the gender divide in that, uh, about 68% of the, of the contributors are, are, about 70% of the contributors are male and about 30% are female. Um, now, in order to diversify the pension space, in 2017, we had, uh, in 2015, we had reviewed our pension law, uh, which allowed for the, for the introduction of voluntary pension schemes. Uh, to date, we have about uh, 12 uh, schemes registered with about 65,000 members, uh, but the majority of those schemes are complementary schemes, which are uh, employer-sponsored. So altogether, you know, those schemes are basically covering uh, um, the, the, those that are formerly uh, served. So the government actually realized, you know, we, can, we cannot leave out the 90% of the working population that is not covered by pension. And so, you know, comes the long-term savings scheme, which was named Ejoheza. Ejoheza is the Kinyaranda word for basically, um, loosely translated in English, it would mean a bright future. Um, and so I think that the name really does uh, align to what the objectives of the long-term savings schemes are, which is to assure you know, the public of, of, of a, a decent, um, respectful, respectable retirement, you know, when when, when that time comes. Now, um, the way the scheme is structured, it's a very simple scheme to register. Uh, you, As long as you have a, a national ID, uh, it's voluntary. You can self-register on the mobile phone. Um, you don't have to have a smart, fancy phone to do that. Um, you can register yourself using a USSD code on, on any feature phone. Uh, you can register yourself on a web portal. You can register yourself uh, through different outlets uh, that are, are across the country. Uh, and uh, if you use the USSD phone, you know, it's been really simplified. Um, it, it's available in the three languages that are used in Rwanda, Kenya, Rwanda, French and English. Uh, you are able to access uh, your statement. I liked what uh, um, um, uh, my colleague from India was sharing about, you know, seeing your statement and seeing your money grow and how that has been, uh, you know, an encouragement for people to save. Um, and alongside that, then there's also a government co-contribution, um, which incentivizes people basically to save within at least the first three years. Um, and alongside it, you know, it's bundled with a life insurance product as well. Uh, you're able to cash out on 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 the on, on the fund, you know, when when you reach uh, 55, or if in in the event of disability, you can cash out up up to 40 percent of the fund um, to to finance housing uh, and and education uh, needs, uh, as long as there's a certain minimum that you maintain on the account. Uh, it's also available for foreigners living in the country. So in the event that you're migrating, you're leaving the country permanently, you're able to also draw down on your on your savings. And in the event of death, of course, uh, your heirs are also able to, to draw it down. In addition, it can also be used, your savings can also be used as security for borrowing for housing and things like that. Now, uh, if you if we go to how has the fund, uh, and sorry, maybe just to clarify also on the government contribution, um, the way uh, we're structured in Rwanda, um, the population or households have basically been um, categorized uh, uh, ba on the basis of the, the, the earning capacity of the household um, and into different categories. So you have a category for those that are, are not able to work, they are disabled, you know, they, they are really poor and need uh, government support that would be like the baseline uh, level then there are those that earn let's say about uh, 45 uh, the equivalent of about 
fifty dollars, let's say, um, that's one category, and you know uh, how much land you have and uh, and things like that. And then it goes up to you know the uh, up to category five, which is basically um, high income earners. So government can contribute co contribute for you to 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 the extent of about fifteen thousand fifteen dollars, let me say, um, equivalent if you're in category one and two. So those are really the low income earning population. And also, uh, and that's 100%, they'll match what you've contributed in each year uh, over a three-year period. And if you're in the third category, also they will match up on what you have saved, uh, but up to 50% of your savings. Um, so, so that has really helped in, 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 uh, in um, encouraging uptake. How is the fund doing? Uh, so far, it has grown tremendously. I was just looking at the numbers, and I think that one thing that has been encouraging, you would have expected that in the period of a pandem pandemic, you know, people are preoccupied with so many other things. But we've actually seen that uh, the number of savers, the savings in the scheme have actually uh, or, or, or more than tripled, almost quadrupled, actually, uh, between 2020 and 2021. And this is in the midst of a pandemic. So I think that that really sends a very loud, encouraging message that once people become aware, um, the, the, you know, the willingness to save is there. So today, uh, the fund, the scheme has grown to, we have uh, about 1.5 million subscribers, 87% um, of which are in the informal sector. And uh, the split between men and women, we have uh, uh, about 58% uh, females and 48% females and about 52% males. Um, for people who are actually actively saving, it's about 1.1 million of, of, of that. And there we see, um, you know, it, it, we've split evenly between men and women, 50% men and 50% female. So I think for me, the message there is that women actually can save. I guess sometimes we have a, a, a preconceived idea that, uh, you know, we are preoccupied with so many uh, other expenses. But what the scheme has shown us is that women, uh, once they become aware, once the, the products are available, they can, they can and do save. In addition, the, the the scheme has grown to about fifteen, close to sixteen billion Rwanda francs. That's about sixteen million uh, U.S. dollars. Um, the majority of that, close to seventy percent of that, is savers that are from the informal sector, uh, and about forty-eight percent again of those savings are related to to to, to women. Um, I think I did, and, and the other thing is it's spread across the 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 the, the country. It's it's in you know all the provinces of the of of, of the of the country. Are involved, so it's really up to the grassroots, uh, to the grassroots level. Um, in terms of what has uh, has has worked, uh, again, you know, I spoke about the the the, the government co contribution being such a key uh, enabler. Um, access, of course, to the mobile phone, which, you know, enables people to save. And, and the good thing about the scheme is that uh, I think it was Olga that was talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the way formal schemes operate will not be uh, uh, um, right for, for people in the informal sector. So the scheme, you know, is very flexible. You can save on your phone as and when, you know, your money comes in. Um, so I think that that flexibility and accessibility on the mobile phone have have, have played a key role in driving uptake. Um, in, the in terms of challenges, I think, uh, again, the, the experiences from India are very similar to what we face here. Um, will, I, will I actually live long enough to see those savings? Um, you know, can I access my money when I, when when I need it, do I have to wait until I'm 55 or 60? Um, so, so I think uh, around that, I like the ideas around financial literacy, pension literacy, um, promoting awareness, going to the grassroots, um, partnerships with with uh, other institutions that are at grassroots level. Um, in Rwanda's uh, experience, we do have um, savings and, and 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 credit cooperatives that are spread across the, the the nation. So, partnerships of the administrator and these grassroots level. Uh, institutions is also, you know, key uh, in, in continuing to drive uh, uptake of, uh, of Asia HESA, uh, the long-term saving schemes that we have here in Rwanda. Uh, thank you so much, Peace. I'm smiling year to year. Um, I am just so excited to hear about the success. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with yourselves uh, with Pinbox uh, 
on the design and the implementation stage of Edgeohaza. And uh, considering there are only 12 million people in India, sorry, when you come from India, you say only 12 million. But, um, uh, you know, and, and the uptake is already of about 1.5 million people covered out of which, you know, 50% are, or nearly 50% are women. It is just so encouraging to see that these things uh, actually exist and uh, and the success stories between Jeshri Ben, whom we also worked with uh, at Seva, uh, is very, very encouraging. Which, um, by the way, I, I think, uh, Peace, I have to say this for the benefit of everyone, is uh, Rwanda truly is a land of a uh, thousand hills and a million smiles. And I think uh, Ejoheza, the name fits in just right, coming out of those beautiful hills. Uh, but um, Olga, just coming to you, uh, Peace is you know, uh, spoken about the success of the scheme being around co-contribution, regulatory, government environments, policy makers, uh, uh, you know, giving access, having a whole tie-in of public-private partnerships. So, you know, uh, I, I think the problem, whether they're success stories or their problems, the, uh, they are unique uh, for women, they're unique or, or similar um, you know, in Africa or the woman is in Latin America or in Asia. So do you think there is a role for pension regulators and governments worldwide uh, to mount a collaborative effort to solve such problems at scale, especially around uh, pensions uh, for women? Uh, can uh, can IOPS uh, do something in the area, given the success stories? Because we know that it can work. Uh, yet it seems to be a little far from several countries. So what part do you think regulators, governments, or IOPS can actually play in this? Uh, thanks, Barul. Yeah, I think that is, is, uh, is relevant to have a coordinated effort uh, on these issues. Uh, in the international meetings and in IOPS meeting also, uh, uh, coverage uh, is a relevant uh, issue. Um, um, the main the main element uh, under continued analysis are always coverage adequacy and, and financial sustainability and the and the inter uh, link that you have uh, uh, among them and um, and I think that the main um, the main the main role of this organization is to is to be able to analyze uh, all the supervisory efforts uh, taken by different countries, uh, uh, and in that way, uh, we can learn uh, about uh, other experiences. So um, we have studied uh, the measures all countries uh, have taken or are currently taking um, to increase coverage uh, and incorporate different type of workers. And, uh, and one specific topic on their, on their analysis recently uh, has been the incorporation of non-standard forms of work. Uh, you know that uh, because of the pandemic, uh, the there's an increased participation of these uh, non-standard forms of work. And it's, it's relevant then to analyze uh, if they are participating in the, in the pension system and what are the main limits that the that the structure and design of the of the pension system have uh, for the incorporation of this uh, of this uh, type of workers. So there uh, we have analyzed uh, uh, the level of the con the contribution rate. Uh, what are the requirement for vesting period, portability of plants, uh, early access to savings. Uh, and um, and looking at what are the, the the main difficulties that these type of workers have to to say, and and there so I can just uh, some highlights uh, in the discussion is uh, is the role of uh, of financial education, uh, financial in inclusion, and also uh, how we can learn for for instance from behavioral economics uh, to. Uh, introduce a uh, new new measure to incorporate this type of workers and also the the increase uh, role of digitalization uh, i think that the digitalization has a, uh, has a, is, is, is very powerful in terms of incorporate workers and also to improve the their savings uh, and um, uh, 
talking about this, um, uh, if you will allow me to give uh, some more general recommendations, uh, and, and I think that because of the pandemic, this is very relevant uh, uh, to uh, promote um, a massive and inclusive access to digital technologies uh, to improve the, the, the digital transformation of companies, especially as, as small companies. Uh, and also a uh, digital education of the population uh, because we, we, we are seeing a transformation of the labor market and, uh, and the social security also need to adapt uh, to, to be able to provide uh, security uh, for this uh, uh, transformation of the, uh, of the labor market. So in that sense, the, the pension regulation need, need to be more flexible, more, more flexible to allow people maybe without an, a, a mandatory individual account, a people that is not contributing to, formally to the system to be able to, to have savings for pensions through uh, additional challenge. And I think that is that challenge can be provided by uh, technology uh, to allow them to save uh, in a flexible way. Uh, and also something that uh, we haven't talked yet in the panel that I think that is a very very relevant topic and is uh, also more important for women is about long-term care and to have a long-term uh, term care system. Um, uh, I think that given that the increase of longevity, this is going to be a very relevant issue in the future and related to this, also consider how to give pension benefit to, to women women that do not work uh, because they are taking care of the elderly uh, with the, in a dependent situation or the, with uh, disability problems. So, so I'm going to stop here, but, but I think that this, this last topic also is a, is a topic that is going to be very, uh, very relevant in, in the future. Thank you. Uh, Olga, thank you so much. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, very important points on making uh, schemes portable. Uh, regulators are looking at schemes that can be flexible. Uh, technology playing a, 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 a huge part in delivery. And of course, uh, the long-term care that women require. Uh, I think, Rashmi, here I would like to uh, bring you in and uh, uh, we do understand that the Uganda's pension regulator uh, is uh, planning to launch a fully national digital micro pension scheme for the informal sector workforce. So, where do you think women ch face challenges on a fully digital uh, scheme in in light of what Olga just mentioned? Um, and um, uh, what can regulators and governments and Ulbra more generally can do to uh, create a more meaningful savings uh, uh, for old age for women? Is there a role for some public private partnerships? Is that's something that could be seen. I would love your thoughts on this, please. Hi, Carl. Thank you. Uh, peace has inspired all of us. We need to learn <laughs> from our neighbors. <laughs> um, yes, so the pension regulator is extremely aggressive, very committed, and, and that's absolutely wonderful because we need a micro pension scheme for informal workers, especially one that's more gender inclusive. So in terms of some of the hurdles that we face, and this is common across multiple markets, is uh, you know, you need the basics in place and multiple panelists have spoken to it. One, you need to, uh, the savings is a function of income. So understand how do you segment? So when Peace was talking about the um, Ejoheza scheme, she talked about segmentation based on wealth quintiles. And that's very important because then you're able to incentivize um, women and low income, consume, uh, low income profile households into these categories and then design acquisition or incentive strategies to target them. So it's better identification and targeting. So we, we will have to do that. Um, one, good, one of the good things that we've overcome as a hurdle as Uganda is we have a well-functioning biometric national ID scheme, and we will be able to do effective ID mapping to, um, to the clients and beneficiaries of the scheme. The other building block is as uh, Dr. Olga and Jayashree Ben said, which is on digital literacy and financial literacy. When we then talk about 
you know, um, a digitally enabled solution, we need to make with the, one of the build challenges that we will very quickly run into is the fact that women own the ownership. Women have access to phones, but the ownership of individual phones is actually lower. It's 10 percentage points lower than men. And women have SIM cards, um, but they don't own the phone. And that then becomes a challenge in how they deal with sophisticated or um, products and services there that are beyond cash in, cash out, or beyond just a money transfer. So that's an immediate uh, problem that we'd run into. Will require uh, figuring out ways, both handheld or you can even have QR cards, et cetera. The, the technology today has moved ahead to allow to uh, jump some of these hurdles. Then the other issue that we might have face is the trust. What that is, I and, and I don't know whether it would be helpful to hear from Peace and from uh, Jeshri Ben on like, you know, because in the case of Seva, they had a ready base of women. So trust was already established. But in the case of Rwanda, they were able to build trust, like people were able to trust a system um, that they will, they should be investing in long term schemes. So I'm not, it would be helpful to understand from Olga and Peace on how do they overcome that trust issue that they, they should be doing that people should trust that this will work and money can be accessed and nothing is going to happen to that. So that's that's a big way, that's a big awareness area that I see that needs to be worked upon. And um, I do really like the incentive structure that multiple panelists have mentioned for women. If we are able to figure out fiscal and non-fiscal structures that enable them to achieve their aspirations, whether that's a house or paying for school fees, they, I do see greater adoption. Sorry for going over my time limit. No, no, you're absolutely fine, Rashmi. Thank you. Very important points there on wealth quintile incentives and trust. Uh, we do have just four minutes. I want to get uh, Jeshri Ben's opinion on one thing before we take a couple of questions. So Jeshri Ben, uh, you've been at the helm of innovation always. I remember when women started wearing saris and mobile phones came, you started giving them a thela phone, uh, which was a little uh, cloth bag with a large drawstring that women could tuck into the Indian attire and hence not have pockets where they could put mobile phones. I think that is where the trust story starts. But to Rashmi's question, it'll be great on how you addressed the trust issue. Because I remember at that time when we were doing it, Jeshi Ben, a lot of women would withdraw their money up front to figure out whether the plumbing actually works uh, before they actually latched on to the scheme. So I would love to know how, for the audience, how the trust factor sort of uh, uh, worked for uh, Seva and how these 200,000 women were actually able to join in the first year itself. Sorry, Jeshri Ben, you're on mute. One is, of course, now it is 20 years. So then after 20 years, you know, they need, <laughs> they understand that money, you know, where our money is safe here. Yeah, but I'll just give you an example. When we just started, a, you know, as a small self-help group. So, you know, it's basically going in the village and collecting money and ensuring that, you know, they form, form a group and then they start saving money. So in that case, you know, what, what, uh, I, I, it was very interesting. What did, what happened was that, you know, when we first went there, they were not coming in. They were saying, you know, no, our money is not safe, there's nothing. But then we started talking with them and how bank works and all those things. But then, you know, after one year, they were always saying that after one year, we were, we were saying that, okay, they were saying that, you know, we want to withdraw this money and we were allowing them to withdraw that money so that, you know, they, but then they saw that, yes, when if we are saving and, you know, we are getting back money whenever we want. And then they started doing it. So that was one way of doing it. The second thing was that, you know, we were calling, we were telling them that, okay, you come to the main office and see that, you know, how it is working. And women were coming and then uh, they were asking other women that, is your money safe? And they, said, they would say, yes, we have. So it's kind of a, because they are in the informal sector, but they are working, working together. And when they are talking with each other and when they are getting this kind of, uh, you know, things that, that also helps. That was the third thing. And, and the third thing was the very, very, very good. That, you know, what happened that when she went to the main office, they saw that there were all accounts there. And they were, you know, everyone, once the saving was given then, I mean, they they saw that, you know, there is a saving account. And for 10 years also, if, if our money is here, you know, there's a, there, is, there is accounting here. And they saw that accounting there. So when they saw that, they said that, okay, maybe it is possible. It is good that, you know, they're maintaining good records. So those kinds of small, small things, but we have to show to them that this is how it works. 
Uh, thank you so much. I think we're almost out of time, but we had very interesting questions on uh, what do you wish you had known before the, you launched the pension schemes? Is there a difference in the uptake uh, of schemes between rural and urban sector workers? Uh, what strategies did Rwanda adopt to build the trust? And I think we answered some of those questions with Jeshri Ben. Um, I, there, very interesting, another question on accessibility of funds seems to be an appreciated criteria, but if you make the funds too accessible, will people actually have enough to retire with? Uh, and the last question is around any gig platforms for uh, for uh, social security uh, platforms for the gig workers. Um, I could take that, but I think I would just sort of come to adequacy of savings. Uh, if uh, we could have a quick round on the last questions, we're out of time now, actually. But uh, I could start with you, Rashmi, just in terms of adequacy of savings. If withdrawals are very easy, do people actually do we actually address the problem of uh, of um, the adequate uh, you know micro pensions and people saving with enough, or will we still have the same problem if you make the savings too accessible? I, sorry, I um, I you know I agree and also disagree. First is that what are you what is the problem you're trying to address people will save as dr olga peace and jeshri ben said women especially are already saving they're saving with savings groups they have emergency funds etc so savings are happening and they they know how to save the question is step one how do you address the trust issue if they want to understand how it works how does the plumbing work how do we allow for it to happen and then say okay after you've tested it how do you then build you know how do you show them that their money is growing and then they themselves will say well we want better returns we want to um you know if there are incentives for us to send our children to school or build a home we definitely want to allow for that so i do think that it can be a phased process or a step criteria is not an either or. Um, I agree with you 100%. Olga, for you, how does this pan into the long-term long care for women that you spoke about? Um, yeah, so yeah, I think that adequacy uh, is, is going to be at, at risk uh, if you allow uh, early withdrawals without any type of requirement. Right? So, uh, if, if, you are, if you allow for an early withdrawal, has, has to be for very exceptional uh, circumstances. Uh, and also, uh, you need to uh, improve uh, a design, a, a platform in which, um, uh, in which workers can have uh, emergency savings. Uh, with, because what, what seen that happened with the pandemic is that a large percentage of the population didn't have emergency savings. So that's why uh, we face uh, a lot of pressure, political pressure, to allow for early withdrawal of pension savings. And, and regarding the long-term uh, care, uh, I think that you need a parallel system to the pension system that provide a very robust uh, long-term care for individuals. Uh, uh, and, and maybe something that is consistent also with the pension benefits that you are that you are providing. But given that the longevity is increasing, this is going to be a, a huge challenge uh, in the future. And also in terms of women, we, women usually uh, don't work uh, because uh, because they have to take care of the elderly. Uh, so also you need to think about the type of pension compens compensation for those women that are taking care of someone with uh, with disabilities. Um, thank you, thank you so much, Monica. Thank you. Uh, Peace, um, I I'll come to you as a last word, but just um, uh, and Jeshri Ben thereafter. But, uh, but Peace, uh, there's a question that has come. So what strategies did Rwanda adopt? Uh, I think a similar question to what we asked Jeshri Ben on trust and to get informal sector workforce into um, Edjoheza. Um, I think that uh, one is uh, the, the, the way the scheme itself was structured. Um, there's transparency about how the scheme is structured, the, 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 the intermediaries that are supporting um, the scheme, the separation of, of roles. You have the RSSB as an ad administrator, you have a separate custodian, you have a separate, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, like a, a, an investment manager, I think is what it's called. Fund manager. Uh, 
yeah, a fund manager, a, a separate fund manager, um, and uh, so, so that's one level that that gives this separation of duties that that is transparent and assures the public that uh, that their funds are safe. Two is transparency to uh, for them to see how their funds are growing. So if you put in your money and you're seeing the money growing uh, and you're seeing the, the 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 interest and being allocated to your fund, you actually start to realize, oh, this thing actually does work. Um, I think that, that that's the second leg of transparency. And then third was that government had was was uh, was putting a. a you know, had a stake in this was actually encouraging it. Um, so you actually save your fifteen thousand or fifteen dollars equivalent, and you actually see the fifteen dollars uh, matched by government being credited to your account. Immediately, you start to realize this thing actually does work. Um, so I think that that has gone a long way in 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 pro promoting uh, transparency, winning trust of people, and I guess we also a, a society. I, I can't take it for granted um, that 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 has come to trust. I guess. Uh, you know, uh, institutions, government, and how they work. Uh, so, so that has really helped to 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 win the trust um, of the public. Thank you so much. Uh, please, uh, quick question, Jeshi Ben, and the last question. I know we're already well over time, uh, but uh, Jeshi Ben, um, there is, you know, there's a lot of technology uh, or advancement in technology from the last when you started off doing uh, pensions. India has a robust payment system. There is uh, NPCI, there is uh, Aadhaar, there's National ID, um, uh, there is UPI for payments. There's so many other progressions. Uh, do you think that uh, technology is, uh, is something that either rural woman or the urban woman is ready for today? Or are we still saying that we need to make a few changes uh, before the women catch up? Good, you asked this question because in uh, recently only we started, uh, you know, there's a uh, digital training programs, and uh, what we could, what we saw was that you know, of course, we had to tell them something that you know how, what what are the benefits of it, and how you want to do do it, and what are the what are the secure what are the security things. But once they see it, that it helps them, then they immediately start working on it, even if they are illiterate. They understand it so much, and then we they so at least you know I would say thirty percent of women have started using it, and not only that, then and then once she uses it, then she you know, she also says that to her neighbor that you know, she actually trains other other you know neighbor also. So that is something, and other otherwise even the other thing is that you know the the daughter is always ready to you know train a mother. So this is what we have seen that you know. They are learning from daughters also, but they are they are definitely taking this, you know, this uh, helping. Amen. Thank you so much, Jeshri Ben. I think I completely agree. You empower a woman, you educate a woman, and you change the tribe completely and generations to come. So thank you so much, Jeshri Ben. Peace, Olga, Rashmi, for joining me for this spectacular. Uh, session. Um, clearly, an hour is not enough. This topic needs more deliberation. We need uh, much more engagement. We need more pioneers, more thoughts. Uh, but I'm glad that all you women are at the top of understanding and enabling women uh, to move towards better social security programs. Uh, and there are success stories, there are war stories, and I think uh, learnings and uh, mistakes are equally important. Uh, where we need to reach quite quickly on uh, pension inclusion. So thank you so much once again, Rashmi, Peace, Olga, and Jashin. Have a wonderful weekend and wish you all a very happy, luminous, and bright Diwali. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.